And so I ended up having to call my mom who lived a couple blocks away and tell her to get the police over there. And they, they went over there, but it was all our stuff. So the police really couldn't do anything. He could destroy the whole house if he wanted to. Who I need to be. Hey, Mom Nation, welcome to our From the Heart podcast, where we share inspirational stories, useful information, and we discuss a wide variety of women-related topics. While you're listening to this episode on your favorite podcast platform, please subscribe to our channel and rate us so that we can get this information out to the moms that need to hear it. If you'd like to join the conversation, we are at Mom Nation USA. That's our handle on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Mom Nation, we are back with another episode of From the Heart, where we share inspirational stories, useful information, and we discuss a wide variety of women-related topics. I am Katie, your founder, and I would like to just give a huge warm welcome to our guest today. We don't have our co-founder, Sherry, on today. She had some other things going on, and that's okay. We wish her well. But my goodness, Sarah, we are about to, I'm already getting the chills, we are about to dive into probably one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. And I can't believe that I know somebody that this happened to. So, I mean, I seriously like got the tissues, got the goosebumps already um, because I know the story and I am anticipating what you're about to share with our audience. For those of you who don't know Sarah, haven't seen her around, she's actually been a huge part of Mom Nation over the last, I don't know, I don't even, I feel like I've known Sarah forever. She's been with us for quite some time and She is awesome. She is really interactive and really is passionate about helping support our moms, um, especially in, well, I would say in two areas. One is the area of domestic violence, and we'll get into her story and why she's passionate about that. And then the other is something that we've talked with you about on this podcast before, Sarah, is her weight loss journey and that whole story, which kind of intertwines with this domestic violence story. Um, Again, I have the chills from head to toe. So why don't we just jump into it, my friend? Okay. Let's start at the beginning. All right. Well, so we kind of have to go back to 2013 um, when I met my now ex-husband. Um, but, you know, I, I had always grown up and wanted to get married and wanted to have a family and um, just kind of dream, dreamed of having that person that was always going to be like, my plus one person, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so I met him and he was very charming, very, um, kind and just kind of sucked me in, in a way that I didn't even know I was being sucked in. How'd you guys Um, meet? We met online. Oh, okay. And just kind of started talking relationship grew from there. Did it go quickly? Cause I know (sighs) when you fall for somebody, like I've had this happen in my past, it's, it's fast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty quick. Um, I mean, we, he was a truck driver and so he was on the road a lot. And so, um, we'd spend time together when he came in and, you know, in town and, um, and then we ended up, I think after probably almost a year, we moved in together. Um, and then, you know, he, he always wanted to do everything with me, which I thought was really neat because, you know, I wanted that person that was going to be involved in my life and wanted to travel and wanted to do things and wanted to go hang out with friends and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't see the control side of it until the other side, you know, Mm -hmm. so Um, it started slow. It started with small things. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he would go to events with me and help out at events and I thought, Oh, that's so sweet. That's so nice. But there were ulterior motives and other people saw it. Um, And actually thought it was really creepy. And um, I got hurt by a lot of people too, because they just cut me out of their life. They didn't know how to deal with it. And so instead of talking to me or saying something, um, they just stopped being my friend, which hurt even more. So you were at the time, if I remember correctly, you were a party planner or an event planner or something to that effect. And so he would come to those events with you like a work so, yeah. So I, at that time I sold Lula leggings and I was a, a fashion consultant. And so we did oh, a lot okay. of events. And so he would go to the events with me and we would set it all up and, you know, 
take out all the clothes and set up all the hangers and everything like that. And so he would always come. And there were a few other husband partners that came, but not a lot. Um, but he definitely always wanted to come. And so he would like, I guess what I'm digging for is, you know, oftentimes we're in a relationship and we don't really know, or we're too in love, you know, we're, we're not really um, aware of these beginning signs that we're starting to receive. And like you said, other people could, could see them and, you know, whether they shared that with you or not was, you know, was, was hurtful depending on the direction they went, but like, what kind of signs were you starting to, or what kind of signs were you missing that other people were seeing? I think just him always wanting to be around. Like I could never go anywhere or do anything by myself. You know, mm -hmm. he was always, I'll go with you. I'll do this. I'll help. I'll be there. And people just thought that was a little weird because that's not how a healthy relationship is. You know, a healthy relationship is you guys have your life. You have your people you hang out with. You have your friends. He has his friends. You're okay with each other leaving and going to hang out with each other's friends, you know? So, so he was like trying to tag along with you and the girls. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. I mean, even at times like he hated when I would go to the grocery store with my mom and I would be gone too long. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of times where it was very <laughs> uncomfortable or, you know, couldn't, couldn't do something or I would almost like tell my friends I couldn't go because I just knew that it was going to be a fight. Mm -hmm. And this is before he put a ring on it. Mm -hmm. And so in your mind, you're like, this man's charming. He's spending all this time with me. This is really what I want. This is what I'm looking for. I mean, I was a little girl once. I totally get it. Like I'm envisioning the princess dress and the whole wedding and the whole mm -hmm. thing with all the family and all the friends there to witness it. And so the, this is kind of what was blinding you almost. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that, and so looking back, I mean, he was a true narcissist, which I didn't know what that word meant. I didn't know anything about gaslighting and all these different terms and things that I learned well after everything happened. But, um, you know, yeah, I mean, we had, we had the perfect wedding and his family was there and my family was there. And, you know, we, I mean, we even did like a, I, I have a dance background. And so we even did a fun little like kind of ballroom dancing into like this fun, like hip hop dance. And then back to this ballroom dancing thing. And I mean, it was just, it was perfect. It was like, you know, the, the fairy tale that you thought you always wanted. Um, but it, that was kind of where it really ended. And I started to see the true colors it was right when we came back from our honeymoon. And so things started to change quickly. Oh yes. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a possession thing. Once you get married to a narcissist, they become very possessive and controlling. Um, and some women see it and some women don't, but I definitely, um, I definitely did. We, we were going to a dy dynamic marriage class um, that we had missed our first week. And, um, you know, I always believe in like bettering ourselves and our marriage and in our self, you know, personal development. And so yeah. we wanted to, I wanted to kind of start out our marriage and like, going through an enrichment class and working on our communication and all that. And so we missed our first week, came back in our second week. And on, on the way to our second week, I had mentioned that I had asked the neighbor um, gentleman down the road, who was like 40 years older than me to kind of wash, watch the house and water the flowers so they didn't die because we were gone for a week. And um, he was livid and flipped out. And by the time we got to the class, he was so mad and so upset. He wouldn't even go inside. Um, and it was one of the classes where you like actually didn't participate as a class. You participated with each other one-on-one. -on -one. And so I couldn't even participate in the class, but he ended up leaving and he ran without his shoes on, um, and walked 15 miles home without his phone. I couldn't get a hold of him. And I finally went home and then like four and a half hours later, he banged on our glass front door and scared the crap out of me. And, uh, it was that was the first time I thought, oh, shoot, what did I do? You know, that was a, a lot of bit crazy. It was nothing like what you had seen before. Right. And so there was no violence up until then. No. And there wasn't any there wasn't any violence um, at all, really, in the in the relationship. Towards the end, he got angry 
Um, but he never laid his hands on me. He never did anything like that. Um, and it was just very interesting, you know, that that happened. And it was right after we got married and went on our honeymoon and came back. So kind of like once he knew you were his. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like he had, he had gotten you and mm -hmm. now that you're legally bound. Yeah. That's and he also you know. knew that he knew my morals and he knew my beliefs and my faith, but I wanted to change like the history of my family and I wanted to not be divorced and I wanted to be married forever. And I believed marriage was forever. And he would use things in the Bible, like, you know, you're supposed to leave and cleave your mother and father and cling to your husband. And so you talk to your mom too much, you know, like you don't give me enough time. And so he would manipulate a lot of those things. And um, I mean, I, I probably knew a month into the marriage that it probably wasn't good but I kept trying to stay and trying to think that maybe things would be different and marriage is forever and maybe we can work through it. And he was so manipulative that I didn't really see until I got out of it that, you know, he used a lot of those things against me and for his good and my bad. So a month into the marriage, you guys were together for how long at that point? Total. Um, About almost two years. Okay. So they say, after about a year, you start to see people's true colors, right? Yeah. And, and you saw that start to unfold, especially after you moved in together, because you said it was about a year after mm -hmm. you moved in together. Then he puts a ring on it and it gets worse. Yes. So then, but you had mentioned, and I don't remember, if, sorry, if it was this conversation or a previous conversation, you kind of were blind to what type of abuse you were receive it. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. So I, um, I remember I did a lot of different Bible studies and groups and women groups and things like that. And so I was in a, a group that was called wife up and we were studying a lot about just how to be like an honor, honorable wife and how to, you know, like lift up your husband and how to do all that. And I remember we went around and shared and I, felt comfortable and shared like a fight that we had had. And it was some of the words and the things that he said to me were very degrading and, and putting me down. And um, I had a lady come up to me afterwards and said, you know, that that's domestic violence, what he's doing. And I said, no, I mean, he's never put his hands on me. And that was the first time I've seen kind of the domestic violence wheel um, mm -hmm. that talks about emotional and physical and verbal abuse. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I mean, I didn't grow up with domestic violence. I, I have never known anyone that really was involved in domestic violence, you know? Um, so it was interesting to like, kind of have my eyes open, like, oh my gosh, this is not okay. This is not what a healthy relationship is. You know, we never learn in school, like, what is a healthy relationship? What are right. safe people? You know, like those are things that we have to do and learn and, you know, go to better ourselves. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was a big eye opener. Are you comfortable sharing an example just so that, you know, maybe we have a listener out there that is in the same shoes you were and they just, you know, maybe they're being de degraded also and they don't see it the way they yeah. need to I'm, so a lot of instances, like I manage the bills, I, you know, I'm very passionate about budgeting and like, you know, I, I did the whole Dave Ramsey thing where we had the envelopes and I budgeted to the penny and, um, you know, I would pay a bill and for instance, it would take our account down and he would be like, well, why'd you pay that bill? I mean, I can't believe you paid that bill. And I said, well, it was due, you know, it was our electric bill and it was due on the 10th. I paid it on the 10th. And he'd be like, well, I mean, you took more money than you should have, you know, and just m very manipulative like that. And, um, you know, I can't believe you would do that. What kind of person are you? Um, you know, why would you steal money from me like that? You know, things like that. And it was like, and, and that was kind of one of my questions to like the women was like, if you budget, you know, like, do you pay the bills when they're due or do you like talk to your spouse and you know, because it's, it's new, like marriage is hard. It's hard living with someone else. It's hard combining your life with somebody else. And so, yep. you know, you need to learn how to communicate and what, 
communication styles there are. And, you know, and so I was trying to do that, but um, yeah, I mean, things like that, or um, he would literally flip something and we'd be sitting on the couch talking about a budget or talking about going somewhere or doing something. And he'd be like, and then he'd start getting so upset and be like, I don't know why you always have to plan everything. This was ridiculous. I'm so upset. And he would just like walk away. And I, and I just was like, oh, what just happened? Like, you know, and that's a form of narcissistic abuse is them kind of flipping that and making you feel almost crazy and insane. Like, wait, what just happened? And <laughs> what did I do? You know? Yeah. Um, and he would say things like, you know, I can't believe you're going to wear those pants. They're really tight. Like you really want other guys looking at you like that, you know, things like that, which was not okay. Something you just jumped into there, which is something that I didn't even realize um, the last couple of years, I sort of learned about it. And we've talked about it on the podcast before is, is financial abuse. Mm -hmm. That is something that, you know, again, you know, we're not taught this stuff as kids and we all grow up in different ways and have different family situations and different dynamics that we're growing up in. And, you know, I personally didn't know that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. until I started and, learning about that. And it's so much more prevalent than we really realize. Like, especially with a one income family. Um, I've had some friends that just, I mean, they have to like ask for an allowance from their spouse to have money. And, you know, we're, we're believed to, you grow up, you fall in love, like you combine your life, everything's one and, you know, everything's great. Um, but what I've learned and kind of what my mom told me towards the end of my marriage was that you don't always have to combine everything. And my godmother had an account that her husband never knew about, and they were married 30 years, but she had an account that was, you know, her just in case account. And she would put money in there. And, you know, if she wanted to buy her daughter drapes, she could use money from that. And she didn't have to go do that. But I think it's really important when you're in a healthy marriage to establish whether you have two separate accounts or whether you are okay combining that money or, you know, setting up kind of a budget that you both feel comfortable with. You know, like my friend had to always go and struggle to get grocery money, you know, and he would fight her and ask her why she spent so many, so much money at the grocery and why did she have to buy this and why did she have to buy that and you know, like food for their kids. Like, why'd you buy 10 jars of food instead of five, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that. And so, yeah, I mean, financial abuse is a huge one too. And I think we have to differentiate a bit between, okay, there's communicating with your spouse and they're saying, okay, here are my views on money. Here's how I think the money should be spent. Here's, here are all my thoughts and feelings. And then allowing the other party to do the same and then compromising. So that's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about only one person is in charge and then literally traps or de and or degrades the other party in terms of finances. And that happens a lot in domestic violence situations. They talk the women into being a stay at home wife or a stay at home mom and they talk them into not working and then they are running the household. And so then they've got control over them and, and they can't walk away from it. Mm. So how long did you live in this and did it get progressively worse? It did. Um, so we were married from May of 16 to we separated in June of 18. Um, and it did get worse. I, um, in October of November, October of 2017, um, I started working again. I, I gave up my little row business and, um, I, actually started on my health journey too, and really wanted to kind of earn my own money and make and have a steady income. So um, I got a job at a, a bridal store as a manager, and I loved it. Um, and that made things worse, because then I had a significant amount of money coming in almost as much as him, which was very threatening to him. And I remember it was my first week there, and he was expecting a check from FedEx and um, FedEx had sent a notification to him saying, "Your, you know, your check was rerouted. It'll be delivered tomorrow. 
Well, he freaked out and he said that I stole the check. My mom stole the check that I better have the check to him. Um, and if I didn't have the check to him and the money to him in 10 minutes, he would destroy everything in the house. And so I'm literally at this job, my first week, you know, not knowing what to do. And he starts sending me pictures and he sliced the mini blinds. He like broke this um, bookshelf that we had. He took our sand art from our wedding and threw it at the fireplace and the sand went everywhere. Um, he cut up like our little character portrait thing that we had done on our honeymoon. And he's literally sending me these pictures as I'm at work. And this is deliberate stuff. So this yeah. isn't just, you know, I'm running through a room and just destroying anything that I can that's in my way. This is like, I'm going to do stuff that's meaningful. Oh yeah. And that's hurtful and despiteful. Like we actually, we went to Disney, Disney world for our honeymoon and we bought like a little baby blanket with a Mickey on it. And that was one of the things like he cut it up into pieces and put it on the ground and like took a picture of it and sent it to me. And he's like, I'm going to continue destroying stuff until you send me my money. And so I ended up having to call my mom who lived a couple blocks away and tell her to get the police over there. And they, they went over there, but it was all our stuff. So the police really couldn't do anything. He could destroy the whole house if he wanted to. They couldn't do anything. I wasn't there. He wasn't physically hurting me. Right. And we had a, a counselor that we were going to for marriage counseling that said, oh, he he just has an anger problem. So he'll never hurt you. He'll He just might explode. So he needs to work on how to get his anger down and not explode. He'll never hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> then what? <laughs> yeah. So, um, we, we ended up finally separating and really the only way that I think I was able to kind of get away from that was that he was able to find another woman that he was kind of leached to. And so we separated and then they stopped talking and then he tried to come back and I had already kind of moved on with my life. Um, he, whoa, whoa, whoa. so he was cheating on you. Well, he had, we were selling furniture because we were getting rid of our huge house and going into a condo. And so he met a gal, um, he was selling our entry table to her and then he just started talking to her. And then he said he was moving to Ohio and I was like, you don't know anyone in Ohio. And he, I said, did you meet someone? And he goes, oh yeah, I met someone. And I thought, okay, good. You're like, so, good. Yay. <laughs> so we closed on our house and I moved in with my mom and then he got mad at her because she didn't write him back at one point. And then he moved into the condo that we were going to both get together and tried to continue to get me to come back and get me to come back. And um, I knew my mom was coming to Arizona to um, help my brother and sister-in-law with their baby that was on the way. Um, and so I just made a decision that if I wasn't going to leave, like I wasn't going to get rid of him because he would call my work. He reached out to friends via Facebook um, he even went as far as he sent me a message that was like, I know you want a child. I can't, you know, I can't imagine you having a child with anybody else. Um, why don't we have a child? I'll flip another house and we'll do like a life insurance policy on me. And then after you have a child and we have another house flipped, I'll like kill myself in a car crash and you can have all the life insurance money. And I was like, I've got to get away from this guy because uh, it's, it's yeah. just not going to it's not going to end well. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I ended up just leaving and he had no clue I was leaving, um, in August of 18. So you got out like middle of the night kind of stuff or, um, yeah, we left early in the morning. I mean, we weren't together. We weren't living together. So right, right. Okay. Um, I, you know, he knew my mom was moving and I just put, put myself on the truck with her and you know it was already in storage because we were separated and I was kind of staying at her house trying to figure out what where I was gonna go um so we just went over to a storage unit at night and grabbed my stuff and then we left at like five in the morning so you came to Arizona from another state mm -hmm. you're in the middle of a divorce probably proceedings began in the other state so you're like having to deal with that um, yeah so he actually filed um he did it, well, it's a funny story. So our counselor, he kept threatening to file and threatening that it was over. And at one point, our counselor said, we, you need to stop saying that you're going to do it or you need to go do it. And so we went down to the courthouse that day and filed for the course. And that was February of 2018. But then he was like, well, we don't have to go through with it. I just got tired of him saying that I wouldn't do it. So I went and did it. 
Wow. Okay. So you're still in the middle of this. So you guys are still dealing with, it's not final yet, right? Right. Okay. So take us from there. So I moved to Arizona. I got my own place. I had freedom again. I could do what I wanted. I could go where I wanted. I was going through um, a divorce care class and trying to kind of like heal and work through that stuff. And I decided that really wasn't the best for me um, just because I wasn't where those other women were. You know, I had been done a while and I had kind of worked through a lot of stuff and, um, you know, they were kind of right there and, you know, had just gotten divorced or had just found out that their husband was leaving or cheating. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it it wasn't the best thing for me, but um, I, I was thriving on the fact that I was finding myself again. I had lost who Sarah was. I had lost my passions and everything like that. And uh, I had lost 83 pounds, which it was, I had just kind of hit my goal weight and it was kind of a new way of living. Um, and that feeling really, great. you were, I mean, just a great time in your life. Yeah. And that really, I mean, losing that weight and kind of working on my mindset was really what gave me the confidence to actually be able to leave finally. Mm-hmm. Um, because before I, I didn't have confidence and I just thought, you know, nobody would want to be with me. And I was at the heaviest weight I was at. Um, and so, you know, I lost 83 pounds and I was living life and I was going shopping again and liking what I was wearing. And, you know, we were going paddleboarding, you know, some of my friends, cause I, I had lived here before. So I still had some dear friends that were still here. Um, and you know, my sister-in-law and brother were here. So, um, yeah. So about three weeks into being here, um, I hadn't spoken to him at all. You know, I told him we were done. And so I just was moving on with my life and I get a text and I get an email to both my emails basically saying, um, I'm so excited. I can't wait to be in Arizona with you. Like we're going to start our life over. We're going to like, you know, it's going to be awesome. We're going to leave all this bad stuff behind us here. And we're going to like have a fresh start in Arizona. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, Oh, okay. Wait a minute. uh, What makes you think that we're starting over here? Like, yeah. Wrong number. Right. So it literally took me overnight to even respond to him. And, um, my response was, I'm not interested. I, you know, I moved on. I have a different life. Um, you know, I wish you the best. I want you to be happy but I have no interest in being with you. And he wrote back and said that he had an interview on Friday and he was coming to Arizona and couldn't wait to see me. And I, again, said, I'm not interested in seeing you. Nothing's changed. Like we're not going anywhere. We have no future together. Um, And are you being careful at this time because you know how volatile he is or are you just like, Hey, I'm so far away. Like, no, I mean, I wasn't, no. I mean, I, I used to like go to the movie theater and check in at the movie theater and be like, yay, you know, Hey, I'm at the movie with my mom watching this movie, you know? Um, or I, you know, would go to like Lake Pleasant and be like, Hey, we're paddleboarding on Lake Pleasant. You know, um, I don't, I never posted like a, where I lived or my apartment complex or anything like that, but I would post flowers or pictures when I was walking my dog or you know, things like that. But, um, I mean, I never thought what happened would happen, but I, you know, um, I never was like, Hey, this is where I live and this is what I'm doing and things like that. So, and, and I'm sure you never thought what happened would happen, especially since your therapist said he would never hurt you. Mm -hmm. Um, but were you careful with your communication back to him or were you just like, bro? No, I mean, I no, I just told him like, I, I have no interest in being here. Like, I don't want you out here. We have no future, you know, like things have not changed the whole time we're married. So we're done, you know, like just stay there, just do whatever. And so he ended up coming. And at that point, I didn't really believe he was here. Um, because he used to always have no problem, like sending me his location on the iPhone, you know, how you can do that or, you know, sending me a picture to prove that he's at a certain place. Um, and 
he wouldn't do that. So I thought, okay, you know, he's playing mind games again. He's, he's doing these tricks. And um, so he told me he was here. He told me he had his interview. Things went well. Um, that, you know, if I didn't want him here, he was just going to stay here because there were a lot of like hot women, and you know, things like that. So he was just going to stay. And I, I remember saying, okay, well, if that's what you want, like, good for you. Like, I, I don't care where you live. Just, we don't have any future together, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so he continued to just keep texting me and keep trying to talk to me. And I continued to just say no. And at one point he, I guess, ran out of money and, um, he finally sent me a bill and he was at motel six, um, kind of on the North side of town, which I thought was interesting because with how big Phoenix and surrounding areas were, he was within 10 or 15 miles of where I lived. Wow. But it was still far enough away that it wasn't huge. And so, um, that's when I realized he was here for sure. That was the first time he kind of gave me proof. And then he said he was out of money. He's like, can I just come stay with you? You know, like I'll even sleep on your patio. Like I'll just bring a hammock and sleep on your patio. And I was like, no. And so then he accused me of living with a guy and, you know, doing things like that because, I wouldn't let him come. And um, so at one point he finally kept asking to come, kept asking and I kept saying no. And at one point he said, well, you know, I'm trying to be a gentleman, but um, I already know where you live. And I asked him, well, how, you know, how do you know that? Because there's no, I mean, I never posted, put anything. I never told him. Right. And you were renting. So it's not like he could look that up. It's not like your ownership records would be out. Yep. So he, he found out from a divorce lawyer. Um, they advised him that if he couldn't find me, um, that he could send a letter to our previous address and state, do not send return, do not forward return to sender. Um, and they probably would put the little yellow forward sticker on there and send it right back to him. And that's exactly what they did for both my address and my mom's address. Um, which was within like a mile of each other. So, and I remember a couple of times walking my dog and I thought I saw our old vehicle, but um, at one point when I was over at his apartment, we um, were trying to work things out for the 800th time, you know, and um, our vehicle was stolen overnight and we called the police. And, um, and so it was weird because I thought I saw that vehicle, but it wasn't the vehicle because the vehicle was stolen. And so I just kind of talked myself into like, I was kind of freaking myself out. And the vehicle also had these stickers on it, which were like these runner stickers and on the front, um, which come to find out he actually put stickers over the places that he keyed the vehicle one time because I told him I was going to come pick it up because it was in my name and he had threatened to not make the payment. So I said, well, I'm going to come pick the vehicle up. And so he went out there and keyed it from front to back on each side and wrote bitch on the hood. Yeah. Okay. So he knows where you are. Yes. Yep. So I continued to say, I don't want to see you. He said, you know, can we meet up? I just need closure. Um, He was going back to being a full-time on the road truck driver. He had gotten a job. Um, he had a flight he was supposed to fly out Wednesday and he said, can I just meet you somewhere? And so at this point, I had a little bit of like, I'm not going to let you come to my apartment, you know? Um, so I agreed to meet him at a ice cream shop, um, in a public place. And I started running late with one of my friends and, um, (laughs) excuse me, uh, And I had texted him and said, Hey, I'm running late, you know, I'll be there soon. And he got very upset and angry. Like you can't even make me a priority again. This is ridiculous. You know, you can't think of me first. You always put everybody else above me, blah, 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 blah. And so he said, don't even bother coming. So Wednesday, he uh, made an anonymous call to my sister-in-law and said some crazy, horrible things to her because she was still back in New York. And my brother called me and said, do you need to call the police on this guy? So I called, of course, the police couldn't do anything because I didn't know where he was. Right. So they took a 
report, made a report in case something happened, um, they would know who to look for. But um, there wasn't anything else they could do. So that was Wednesday. And I had told them, like, leave me alone, leave my family alone. And I had blocked them at that point. Wow. So, and you thought it was over, like he was leaving. Yeah. I thought he left on the plane and he was going to Colorado to pick up his truck and go back on the road. But he didn't leave. No, he didn't. He didn't leave at all. So Saturday morning, um, I was supposed to go to the junk in the trunk market with my mom. And I always got up and would, first thing I would do would go out, you know, go outside and walk my dog. Um, and so I got up, leashed my dog up, opened the front door and, um, he was right there standing around the corner and, um, he sprayed me with raid. He pushed me back into my apartment. He started trying to like push his fingers into my eyes, put his fingers in my throat as I'm screaming, yelling. Um, he took off his sock and put his sock in my mouth to make me stop screaming as I'm screaming and yelling, help, help, help. You know, I'm asking him, what do you want? Why are you doing this? As he's still trying to like strangle me and get me to shut up. And um, then he dragged me into the living room and told me that he had been watching me for two weeks and um, he had to buy these stupid binoculars and he had been around the apartment for two weeks with binoculars and he had to learn all about birds and um, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't handle the fact that I was happy and moving on with my life. And he wasn't because, um, he couldn't move on with his life and I, we were supposed to be together forever. And so I asked him, I said, you know, what do you want? Like, why are you here? What is, what, what do you want? He said, well, I want closure. And I said, okay, what is that? And he said, well, I want to make love. And so I said, okay, well, fine. You know, like yeah. anything, like if that's all if that's what you want and then you'll leave, like fine. And, um, so we went to walk towards the back room and I actually tried to run out the front door and, um, it was locked. So I couldn't get it unlocked and get out fast enough. And, uh, he threw me back down and he put a zip tie. He brought, he brought, uh, <laughs> the prosecutor calls it a murder kit, but he brought this little Dallas cowboy lunchbox that I had bought him. And it had everything that he brought to try to kill me. So he brought two knives. He brought a very long, like the long zip ties, not the little ones, but the long zip ties um, and plastic bags and um, jig keys. And so um, he put the zip tie on my wrist and it was so tight. My hand started turning purple. And I said, please like undo this, you know, like my hand's going to fall off. And so he said, you know, don't scream anymore. Don't try to run. And I said, I well, won't just please take this off, you know? So he ended up taking it off. Um, he pulled out a knife and it was actually the knife that I gave him as a wedding gift the night before. Um, and it said Sean Hubby on it. And so, um, we went back into the bedroom and started talking and he was like, you, you know, you're a liar, blah, 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 all these things. Like we should be together. He told me that he had created a face Facebook profile and a fake Facebook profile and was watching me. And he had pretended to be another health coach and had friended all my, my fellow health coaches and me and was talking to me about like, just, can you help me? Can you mentor me? You know? And at first I thought it was just another person. Cause that's kind of, you know, what we do How it goes. Yeah. Um, but then that this person started talking about, Oh, I have a son who's in Chicago. And I think you guys would really be cute together. And so I started getting the sign that it might be him and not, you know, not it just didn't actual feel issue. right. Yeah. But, so, um, it did turn out it was him, but um, he told me, he said, you know, I've been watching you and you're so happy and you're done with your life. And he said, you know, we're supposed to be together forever. And he said, um, one of us is going to die today. He goes, um, I came to kill you. And he said, I'm going to kill you. And then I'm going to go kill your mom. And I was like, okay, this is awesome. So, um, I mean, it really, it, 
between like, it was by the grace of God and by, I had watched a leadership training and I had kind of learned like the square breathing and like breathing in for four counts, holding for four counts, being out for four counts and holding. And I just remember like that being in my head and I just continued to like do that and continue to breathe and just not freak out and just do everything I could to kind of fight for my life. So it was, it was about a three and a half hour fight for my life. Um, he had trash bags where he like put the trash bags over my mouth and my nose and he would try to suffocate me. Um, he had me on the bed at one point and had a bag over my head and I couldn't see. And, um, all of a sudden I felt something right below my eye and I heard crunches and he stabbed me in the eye, like right, not in the eye, but right below the eye. He meant to stab me in the eye. Um, and I just remember like grabbing the knife and pulling it out and then like trying to come out under his legs and like sliding down off the bed and I'm bleeding out of my eye. And then he grabs a bag again and tries to suffocate me. And then he grabs a pillow and puts it over my head. And I kept like, he was over my chest area and he would have his knees on my elbows. And I kept like thrashing, you know, my stomach up and he would like fall over or fall off or, you know, get his balance off. And so I could catch my breath again. And I remember at one point he put the whole bag over my head and put duct tape, duct tape around it. He brought, Oh, that was another thing he brought. He brought gorilla duct tape. Um, and I remember like having to scratch the bag to actually be able to breathe because he had duct tied all around it. Um, and I mean, I just remember like, I was just fighting so much for my life. And, um, there was one point that I actually really thought I was going to die. I was kind of wedged in the corner and he was on top of me and I, he had a bag over my face and I kept trying to like move him, but he had walls on both sides of him. And so he wasn't getting off of me. And I remember like just being really shallow breaths and like my body started becoming lethargic and I started not being able to breathe and kind of gasping for air. Um, and I just thought, okay, you know, I guess, I guess this is my time that I'm going to go home and, and see God. And then I just thought of my mom and I thought of like, like, how is my mom going to be able to like live without me? And that really kind of gave me the strength to like fight a little bit more and give me that edge a little bit more. Um, and so somehow I got him off of me and, but that was the one time I really thought like, okay, this is it. I'm going to die. Well, and then at this point, I mean, three and a half hours in, you got to imagine your adrenaline is starting to probably peter out. Oh yeah. And, and you're bleeding and your adrenaline is pumping that blood. So you're losing blood still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was very interesting. It was like bleed and then I stopped bleeding. And I, at one point I was on my stomach to try to like get air and I've never broken a bone in my life. Thank God, you know, <laughs> but I remember he was pulling on my shoulder and I just remember like this horrible, excruciating pain and like snap. And I got up and I could barely move my shoulder. And this was like midway, like this wasn't even the end of it. This was midway. And it was excruciating pain. I had no clue what happened. Turns out I tore my AC and tore my rotator cuff. But um, I ended up being able to talk to him and like, say, hey, let's go to have breakfast you know, let's go talk as I'm bleeding out of my eye and, you know, let me go make breakfast, which actually was a whole nother God thing because I was at the store with my mom and I didn't, I used to get up every morning and cook at breakfast and I didn't have eggs. I didn't have a coffee machine. And I just had this feeling like, well, you know, I'm eating healthy. Sometimes I don't feel like cooking, you know, a full meal. So like I'll have three eggs. So I'm just going to buy some eggs and Hey, I kind of miss coffee. So I'll buy my creamer and coffee and just buy this little coffee pot. Well, that's what I cooked him every morning. And so I, a week before had bought that stuff and had that stuff to be able to be like, Hey, let's, let me make us breakfast. What I used to do and let's sit down and talk. And so that was kind of a way I could restore my energy and kind of take a break. And I remember just sitting there trying to think how I was going to escape. And just thinking like, okay, my thought was always, if you live in an apartment and people hear you scream, they're going to call the police. Well, um, this is three and a half hours of a struggle. Right. Like thrashing around. Yes. 
Yeah. And you're on the third floor? Mm hmm. Yeah. So people below me. And they were home? Me. Oh, yeah. I actually received an email from the gal below me who was a, the leasing agent that leased me my apartment. And it was at 10 o'clock that day. And um, it said, you know, I, I hate to send you this, but if you could just kind of like keep quiet hours, you know, between like nine and nine in the day. Um, I heard some screaming and thrashing around and I actually had to move out to my living room and I continued to hear it. And that really kind of kept me up. So if you could just kind of make sure that you, you are quiet between nine and nine. And I thought, okay. call the cops people. Right. Oh yeah. And, and come to find out there were like two other people that heard screaming and did nothing. Like one lady defined it as like terrifying screams and stuff. But she didn't know where I was coming from. So she just continued on with her coffee outside. People, you heard it here. It, it's okay to call the, I mean, I think, throw tomatoes at me if I'm wrong, but like, it's okay to call the cops if you hear something that's completely out of the ordinary like that. Oh, yeah. And let's, let's just say it happens to be not, out of the ordinary and maybe people just like being loud um but it's okay to do that it's okay to get involved yeah. because you could be saving somebody's life this is insane yeah and come to find out i didn't even know this but there's a safety feature on the iphones and it's an emergency safety feature where you can click the side button five times and it'll actually notify the police that you're in danger and you set up your emergency contacts and it'll notify your emergency contacts and say, Sarah just contacted the police and it sends the police and those people your location and says, she's in trouble, she needs help. I've had an iPhone my whole life. I never knew this feature. And I had a, I had a watch too. <laughs> and the watch, you can just, I think, press the button and hold the button down. Just hold it, yeah. Yeah, I never knew never knew anything and it's crazy that i had my watch and my phone and i could have i be i believe the, the <laughs> i believe the i watch has an it might not have been around when you those first generation watches back then but i think it's got like a if you fall down real hard mm -hmm. it will also yeah. call emergency services too and i'm sure you fell down real hard a few times yeah 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 so it, it's very interesting to know that people heard me and heard things. And um, there was actually another um, husband, a father that saw him with the binoculars two different times and just ran him off, like talked to him and told him he needed to leave. Never called the police, nothing, but saw him like, and thought he was looking in his daughter's bedroom. So instead of calling the police, he just was like, you need to leave. This was inappropriate. Mm -hmm. He wasn't looking at his daughter's bedroom. He was watching me. He told me he was watching me do pu puzzles at night because that was kind of my debriefing. And so I would sit at my kitchen table and, and do puzzles. And he he saw me. He watched me at night. He watched wow. me all hours. So I don't yeah. do puzzles anymore. <laughs> but I don't blame you. I mean, God, <laughs> people, when you see things that are out of the ordinary, you've got to speak up. It's just there's two little sweeping things under the rug happening and I'm so sorry. So, so how did you get out? So I was able to convince him that I wasn't happy, that I was miserable and I missed our relationship and that I wanted to go die with him because he had told me that he was going to kill me, kill my mom. And then he was going to drive off a cliff. He already had one up in Sedona picked out. And so, um, I convinced him. I said, I, I, I'm not happy. It's all a show. It's all been fake. Like I miss you. And, you know, let's, let's go die together. Then we can be together forever. And so he ended up finally agreeing to that after we ended up having closure and um, that didn't go the way he wanted it to go. And so I thought things were going to happen again. And, um, you know, I was trying to do anything I could to save my life. And then we ended up, I put on a hat and put um, sunglasses on and had a paper towel for my eye. And we went downstairs and I just kept thinking like, there's gotta be, there's going to be a way that I'll escape. And I saw a guy across the parking lot and thought there's no way this 
little scrawny guy can save me and fight him off. And so I got in the car and um, we went into the parking lot and I, I said, why don't we go get some ice cream? Because that was something we used to do before my diet and before I lost weight and something we didn't do anymore. And he said that a lot, you know, we, we used to always go get ice cream and now we don't because your stupid diet and your weight loss. And um, so he finally was like, well, <laughs> we can't go into the convenience store because you're covered in blood. I'm covered in blood. He goes, why don't we just go through the McDonald's drive through And I thought, really? <laughs> like, ding, okay, ding, ding. This, is, this is it. You know, like there's going to be a car in front of me, probably a car behind me. So as we're turning and then we turn again, um, I just see like this sea of people, which I had no clue what they were there for. Come to find out it was a car show and they were getting ready to go for a drive. But I just thought to myself, if this is it I, now or never. And so I tried to open the door and the door was locked and he grabbed my wrist and said, I thought you might try something, you bitch. And I was able to open the door again and get out. And I just ran towards the people and I was like, help, you know, he raped me, you know, and I'm bleeding. I'm sure they're petrified. And um, so two guys ran and got in my car and went after him. He blew through two lights and went up towards Camp Verde. And uh, then they called the police and, you know, I had him call my mom because I didn't know where he was going. I mean, he had told me he was going to go kill my mom too. To so yeah. I thought she'd open the door and, you know, so, um, but that was, then he went up to, towards Yavapai County and they ended up catching him up there and then putting him in jail. And the pictures that I saw from your news stories, you looked like you had definitely just been through a oh. four hour struggle. I mean, that yeah. picture that I saw of you lying in the hospital bed. It's, thank goodness that there was something there that helped you, that that gave you the strength mm -hmm. to get out of that because you looked terrible. And I'm sorry to say that. Like, oh, yeah. Um, but and that was right. Terrible. I mean, that was hours after I had got to the emergency room. I mean, that was brutal. And I, I mean, my eye, I lost vision. I'll never see out of my right eye. And I still, to this day, deal with shoulder pain and rotator cuff pain. And, um, but I remember like my eye was swollen shut for two months. It was black and blue and orange and brown and green. And, you know, it was just all these different things. And I remember the doctors like said, it'll never open. It'll never track. It'll never move. Like, you know, you're not going to have any, like the nerve is gone. And so you, the lid of your eye isn't opening, like your eyes not moving. Um, and I just remember like, I was so worried. I love children and children are so innocent and I just didn't want to scare kids. Like I was so worried that a little kid would see me and be so afraid because my eye would never open. And that broke my heart because I never wanted to be afraid to a child, you know, or be yeah. scary to a be child. Scary. Yeah. And luckily, um, you know, it's not fully healed, but you can't necessarily look at me and tell that I can't see out of my eye. I would have never known if I didn't know. Yeah. I would have never known. I would have never picked up on it. Um, so kudos for you for having that strength again to, you know, to be able to help your body heal so that you could yeah. get to a point where it, it looks totally normal. I mean, I know it doesn't feel it doesn't function yeah. normally, but it looks totally normal. And, you know, uh, and luckily, like we finally, I mean, it's been four years, almost, almost to the day. Um, and we went to court and I found the strength to get up on the stand and testify against him. And, um, you know, some of the things he said and some of the, I mean, he did Google searches for every, every way he tried to kill me. Like, how do you kill someone by stabbing them in the eye? Wow. So like, he meant to stab me in the actual eye, you know, um, how do you like have sex with someone that's unwilling? Wow. Like, yeah. I mean, just every single way he, he tried to Google every single way he tried to kill me, he Googled it. And so luckily, um, it was a six week trial after four years and I was there every day except one day. And I just wanted, I wanted him to know that he didn't have any power over me. He didn't have any, you know, like I wasn't afraid of him, even though 
I sort of him. Um, you know, if he ever gets out, I think he would come back and do it again. Yeah. And that's my fear. And that's why I think it's really important to protect yourself and, and know how to, you know, self-defense. And if you're comfortable with a gun, make sure you know how to use it and carry it. Um, but he was found guilty on all counts and he was actually found aggravated on the sexual assault account, which is really good. And so the sentencing is August 26th and we actually find out how long he gets in jail, but he, uh, he hasn't even stopped in jail because I found out from one of his aunts that he asked to have money put on his books in jail so he could have someone kill me from jail. Wow. Wow. Sounds like we need a part two to this, Sarah. Um, I yeah. know that there was a lot that you went through during the trial. Cause I know you, and I know that we're all, all of your friends are so super supportive and love you so much. And we're so, I don't want to use the word excited, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we're, but we sort of. are, but we, we, we hope that, um, justice is served next week when, when it's time to, to be there for the sentencing and my yeah. goodness, I mean, my heart goes out to you, you know, this hugs, all the things like, we're just all so grateful to have you here. And you know, it's really such a gift to the world too, because I feel like you have, you know, you got, you have a message to, to send and, and, and you have this inspiration to share. And, um, you know, before we hopped on, I asked you like, what, what is your message? What is your message with sharing this story? What do you hope that our audience gets out of listening to this story? And, um, the three things that you shared with me, I thought were incredibly important to share, um, don't be naive. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in a, a good home. I, you know, I didn't have domestic violence in my family. I didn't see it. I never thought it would happen to me. I mean, I thought maybe if I ever went down a dark alley, like some scary person might rape me, but I never went down dark alleys for that reason, you know? So, but I never thought it would be somebody that I knew much less somebody that I had been married to. And known and lived with for years, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it can happen to anyone. It can happen, you know, because of anyone or somebody you think, you know, you know, yeah, you got to be careful to be able to protect yourself. You got to be, um, there's a word that Steve branch with mindset survival, you know, how much we love him too. And he's really helped out a bunch of us. And, uh, the term that he uses is situational awareness. Mm -hmm. You've oh, got to yeah. be aware of what's going on. Um, you know, when people out there, when you're seeing weird stuff in the complex of your apartment or when you're hearing weird things next door or the person upstairs, or even if you're not in an apartment and you're in a neighborhood and you're hearing weird screams, it's, it's okay to call somebody that might be able to help because you really, truly may be helping somebody that needs it. Two other things real quick. And then I know we're at time. So we got to wrap up. And like I said, at the beginning, I could talk to you forever We need to have a part two about the trial. Yes. So we can talk through that. Um, but there is hope was another message that you wanted to share. Yeah. I mean, if you're in a situation, you know, where it's not healthy, where it's toxic, there's, there's a way out and there's hope and there's, there's people around you. I mean, I, I want to share my story because I want it to help other women and I want it to give other women hope and freedom. Um, I cannot tell you how many women, once I shared my story and, and told a little bit what I was able to before the trial, um, came out and said me too, or, you know, years ago, I have, I had known one girl for 10 years and I never knew that her first husband was as crazy and psycho and threw chairs through her door. And she actually had to like, leave the state and hide out because he, and I had known her for 10 years, but it's, it seems like it's such a hush, hush topic. And that's why I think on part two, we can talk more about that. And, yeah. you know, my passion for like the domestic violence walk that I'm planning and all that stuff. But I just, you know, you're, you don't have to stay in a situation that's unhealthy or that's toxic, no matter what, no matter whether you don't have a job or whether you have children with that person or whatever, there's resources and ways out. And, you know, you can reach out to us, you can reach out to, you know, the local domestic violence shelter or things like that. And there's tons of resources. 
There are. And I know in, in those times you can feel like you're alone. You can feel like you have no choices. And sometimes when we're under a lot of stress and anxiety like that, we fear for our, our lives, even it's hard to get the oxygen to the brain to even think of Mm -hmm. things that we can do to get ourselves out of the situation, which is why I'm just so impressed with, you know, what, what you went through that you were. And that's a whole nother thing. Like I worked with Laura with Benavari counseling before the trial and she helped me really kind of stay like not go into fight or flight when I was on the trial. And, you know, that's, that's a whole nother thing we can talk about too, but she's yeah. incredible. Um, but people do, I mean, people go into, you know, fight or flight or freeze and some people just freeze and don't move and don't do anything. So I'm grateful that I went into a fight mode, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, like we mentioned throughout the show, there's different things, um, that your phone does that your watch does. There's different things that you can do to set yourself up. If you are ever in a situation that you can notify somebody, somebody that's your emergency contact that can, that can help you. Um, I also think it's QT. I don't want to say it wrong, but I believe Mm -hmm. it's QT is a safe zone. You can walk into any QT and let them Mm -hmm. know, Hey, I'm in a situation and you will get immediate help. Um, I have started seeing at uh, different restaurants and bars and stuff around in the stalls, in the bathroom stalls, <laughs> there are some resources and some emergency. Um, you can ask for like a secret shot and they'll or know something. That it's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's different things. Um, just, you know, like Sarah said, we never think that it's going to happen to us. So we need to be prepared for that. And that's not, you know, hey, stress out all day, every day, thinking that something eventually is going to happen to you. Just be prepared for it. Like the Boy Scouts, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, one more thing before we go, you had mentioned, and, and we did talk it through quite a bit um, in the beginning of the show, is just to know that domestic violence um, and or abuse is not just physical. And so we hear a lot about physical, that's kind of where our heads are at, but we've got the emotion, you know, the mental, the emotional and the financial. um, A lot of times it doesn't start with physical. I mean, the more I've learned, the more I've made this kind of my passion and my purpose is it doesn't start with physical. It starts with some type of manipulation, whether that's the finances or the mind or telling you like, you know, nobody will ever want you, you know, you've got a kid and you're, you know, ugly now and you, you know, and, and just beating someone down so much. I mean, it, it starts there and then it goes into more and more and more control. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my friend. Well, we're definitely going to get you on for a part two, because I have so many more things and I know the trial was, was a thing and preparation for that. And I think that that would be really interesting and helpful for our audience to hear. Um, so thank you. And if anybody Absolutely. wants to get in touch with you, um, or, you know, maybe they're a me too, and they want to share their story. Um, are you open for that? Absolutely. So, um, we actually have something called compassion mamas and, um, I have a trauma group that it doesn't have to be just domestic violence, but, um, it's through mom nation. You can find it, um, you know, in Mom Nation AZ, you can go to the group page on Facebook and it's in the events and it happens every other Wednesday night we meet um, and it's a safe place to come and just kind of talk through your trauma. And there's a lot of other, you know, women there that are me too's and, you know, some have experienced TV and some haven't, but um, we're all able to support each other and be accountable. And, um, you know, I think everybody needs that. Totally agree. And if you don't have access to Facebook, that's totally fine. Um, you can visit our website. That's momnationusa.com. Just shoot a message to us. And um, we're always in direct contact with Sarah. We can get you connected with Sarah and get you connected with that um, that support group. It's It's been phenomenal. I've watched it grow. I've participated in it. And I think you're doing really great things out there. So thank you. And thank, thank you, for, you for being here and for sharing. I know this wasn't easy. Yeah. And thank you for having me and allowing me to just be able to hopefully bring hope to other people and help them get out of a, out of another toxic situation. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think it's very needed and this, this conversation is not had quite enough. Yeah. All right, guys, if you are interested in being a guest on the show, like Sarah, please follow us at mom nation USA. That is our handle. We are on Facebook. We are on YouTube, Instagram, and I just gave you the website, but I'll give it to you again. It's momnationusa.com. Shoot us a message and let us know why you'd like to be a guest on the show. While you are listening to this show on your favorite podcast platform, 
please subscribe, download, and rate us so that we can get this info out to the mamas that need to hear it. Thank you again, Sarah. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.